very nice to see a great crowd. I'm going to hand over to Mike Brett from Civil and Environmental Engineering for today's speaker, Jim Okay, so I, I know in this department that you guys have a tradition of coming up with outrageously embarrassing stories to tell about people before their seminars begin, but I can't say that I know David well enough to come up with any of those. Um, he works with uh, preventative cardiovascular disease, especially um, factors associated with uh, heart disease. And uh, I checked up on his citations. He has about uh, 600 publications and 26,000 citations. He has more citations in the last two months than I had last year, which means he's either extremely good or I'm really bad or both. Um, I noticed that there's one D.S. Siskovit who has published 450 papers out of the University of Washington, and then there's 200 D.S. Siskovics that have published one or two papers at 100 different universities, and I haven't figured out. They all work on the same topic, though, so I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, he's recently published high-profile papers on the effects of being overweight on uh, overweight during pregnancy on neonatal health and vitamin D effects on geriatric health and processed meat associations with diabetes. He's done a lot of research on diabetes. And he's published a paper on surprising things that affect memory. I don't know what the surprises are, but I'm sure they're very interesting. Um, but I think he's most famous, and in the context of this talk, he's most famous for his research on the association, the statistical association between consumption of seafood and heart um, He is the lead author on a very famous paper, I think kind of the first really, really high profile paper, or I guess depending on how you define that but a uh, paper published in JAMA in 1995 called Dietary Intake of Cell and Membrane Lipids, um, um, Cell and Membrane Levels of Long Chain uh, Omega-3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids and the Risk of uh, Primary Cardiac Arrest. And the conclusion of that paper is consumption of one fatty fish meal a week reduces your rate of heart attack by 50%. I guess today you will talk about whether that is still the, um, if you're still sticking with that message. So I'll let him take it from here. <laughs>
Unfortunately, Irena, who was a PhD student, was working with Marion Charles, and Marion and Irena helped him get going uh, in terms of working uh, in this area that I'm going to talk about today. Oops. I really gave you a quick tour of what I was um, Darius Mosafirian was one of our uh, graduate students who's now uh, a professor at Harvard. Uh, e. Ragnathan was our first uh, statistician who worked with us. He's now the chairman of, bio of biostatistics at the University of Michigan. Bob Knott was the head of Northwest Lipid Research Clinic and the Clinical Nutrition Research Unit, unfortunately deceased. Glenn Cobb was the founder of Medic One, and he's still very active as a professor emeritus. And uh, I benefited greatly and continue to benefit from uh, many of these, uh, these distinguished investigators. So one of the messages I'm going to uh, convey today is that when you think about fishing taking heart health, uh, or any association, the first question is, what's the question? And one of the one of the sources of confusion in literature is that people don't think about what's the question. What was addressed in that piece of research? What approach was used? What was found? What does it mean? Whenever anybody uses a scientific method, they have to address these four questions. When they read a paper in science, they have to address these four questions. When they write a grant application, they have to address these four questions. So just keep in your mind these four questions. What's the question? What was the approach? What was found and what does it mean? So to, to get through this, I'm going to start with a story. Uh, it's called a fish story. And it's about uh, N3 or omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, my part of vulnerability and sudden cardiac death. We also used to call it primary cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest. It's, I'll, I'll describe it more in uh, detail in terms of what its characteristics are. Right I want to put this work into context. The context is the classic diet part hypothesis which was developed in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on, which basically had this syllogism that, whoops, hitting the forward instead of the, that's okay. So the syllogism was that saturated fat in diet increased serum cholesterol, that high serum cholesterol led to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries leads to clinical coronary heart disease, and clinical coronary heart disease which is known as a heart attack or myocardial infarction or infrapectorous, leads to coronary heart disease mortality. So this is a classic diet heart hypothesis. And when I decided to sort of jump into the water and, and consider issues of nutrition and heart health, uh, this was highly debated whether this diet heart hypothesis uh, was you know, uh, real or not. Uh, the way it works is there was some evidence for each of these lines but there was no evidence from here to here. So it was highly controversial. And you had people like George Mann writing editorials calling, saying, diet heart, the end of an era. You know, we shouldn't waste our time thinking about diet and heart disease. When you think about dietary fat, and I started thinking about it when I decided I wanted to do something in nutrition and such like that. You can think about saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. Within polyunsaturated fat, you can think of long chain N3s like EPA and DHA. You can think of intermediate chain N3s like alpha-linolenic acid. And you can think about intermediate chain N6s like linolenic acid. These fatty acids differ in the number of carbons in the location of the first double bond and the number of double bonds in the fatty acids. And they have different, um, uh, they have different physiologic consequences, potentially different clinical consequences. Their sources in the diet also differ. So obviously, uh, oops, today we're talking about, I'm sorry. Today we're talking about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, so we're talking about EPA and DHA from fish and shellfish. We could talk about um, plant sources of intermediate chain N3s, uh, such as canola oil, which is a combination of apple linolenic acid and linoleic acid. <coughs> Or if you think about vegetable, vegetable seed oils like corn oil, oil safflower oil, um, peanut oil, and so on and so forth, which are predominantly linoleic acid. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on these fatty acids. Okay. So when you think about um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which is the most common form of heart disease in Western populations, you can think about atherosclerosis. This is involves uh, the vessel wall. It's a buildup of, uh, starting with the fatty streak, accumulation of lipid, development of a fibrous plaque. In terms of converting a subclinical disease to clinical disease, you have rupture or erosion of a plaque, and you get inclusion of an artery with the thrombus, 
and you have a heart attack, or you have unstable angina pectoris, or you have what's called an acute coronary event today, and that's sort of this, this manifestation, an acute cardiac event due to an atherothrombotic event. But there's also sudden cardiac death, which is primarily uh, an arrhythmic or electrical event that occurs in the setting of atherosclerosis and atherothrombotic event, but it can also occur in the absence of, of an acute atherothrombotic event. Now, in terms of fish intake and heart health, a lot of this started, as you know, in the studies of Greenland Eskimos, so-called ecological studies, which suggested that high intake of these fatty acids, these marine oils, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, uh, were associated with a low incidence of coronary heart disease within a, within a, uh, uh, a geographically defined region, such as Greenland. So basically, you're looking at rates of coronary heart disease mortality and the the amount of long chain entries consumed in the population, and you're saying that there's there's an inverse relationship. If you take in if the, in the populations that take in more of these fatty acids, they tend to have lower rates of coronary heart disease. These ecological studies do not obtain information on individuals, so they don't assess the exposure, the outcome, or characteristic and outcome in the same people. They're looking at rates of disease in that geographically defined region compared to uh, rates of exposure to some factor. So then you, you go from these ecological studies to studies of individuals in what's called cohorts. So you assemble a group of people, you assess their exposure to something like intake of fish, um, type of fish, and so on, and then you assess over time whether they develop heart disease and what types of heart disease they develop. So you have a large number of observational studies. This is an incomplete uh, list of studies. There, there, there are many times this but when I was getting into this field, um, I actually started with the Zipkin study, which was published by Don Cromwell in the New England Journal of Medicine in like, 1985. And in that study, uh, uh, Dr. Cromwell suggested that consumption of one fatty fish <laughs> a week was associated in this cohort with uh, a 50% lower risk of mortality from coronary heart disease. That was the conclusion. <clears throat> and nobody believed it. Almost no one believed it. Because it was too good to be true. How can consumption of one fatty fish more a week be associated with a 50% lower risk of mortality from coronary heart disease? And in fact, when uh, some of these studies were done, they didn't find the same thing. Um, and one of the things that happened was that, that, as we'll see, there are potential reasons why there were inconsistencies in the findings from these studies that relate to what I put up first in terms of the four questions. What was the question? What was the approach? What did they find? And what is it? So in terms of follow-up, one of the differences across the studies was that some studies looked at coronary heart disease mortality, as Dr. Brown or they might have even looked at something like sudden cardiac death. And other studies looked at non-fatal myocardial infarction, or a combination of fatal events and non-fatal events. Some studies looked at total fish intake, irregardless of the type of fish. Some studies did, were conducted in populations where the predominant type of fish consumed was lean. Other populations looked at fatty fish. Some focused on the omega-3 fatty acid content of the fish, some didn't have that information, they just focused on whether they were fish eaters or not. And importantly, in these different studies, they looked at different questions in the sense that they, they examined different parts of the range of intake and the dose response. So if you have a population where everybody is a fish eater, you can't look at the question of some versus none. You can only look at the question of more versus less. If you study physicians or nurses or health professionals, then this is the question you can address because almost none of them were non-eaters of fish or shellfish. If you have in a population where there is a reasonable proportion of population that's consuming none, then you can use that as the reference group and compare some versus none, and you can compare more versus less. So the point is that these are potential differences in study questions that relate to differences in study design, that relate to differences in study findings, that relate to differences in terms of what is it mean. But unless you think about these things, 
you would, you would assume that if five studies showed that it was associated with a lower risk, and five studies showed that it wasn't, that, you know, obviously, if you add up the studies, there's nothing going on there. And if you do that, you may very well miss an important observation. Okay, so we were interested in a specific outcome, sudden cardiac death. It occurs in the setting of atherosclerosis. It results from a life-threatening cardiac arrhythmia where the heart, instead of beating rhythmically like this, starts quivering, fibrillating, and it basically goes like this. And as a result, you don't get effective function of the heart as a pump, so you lose your circulation. You basically collapse because you don't get circulation to the brain. You don't get circulation to the heart. You don't get circulation to the kidneys. And if you're not resuscitated, within four minutes, you die, okay, from this ventricular fibrillation. Even in a place like Seattle, it has a case fatality of over 80%. It's influenced not only by coronary disease, but it's also influenced by myocardial vulnerability. So you have the epicardial coronary arteries that provide blood to the heart. If the blood is interrupted, that's not good. Your heart is at risk. But there are other parts of the heart. There's the heart muscle, and we're talking about the vulnerability of that muscle to this, this condition called ventricular fibrillation. And these events, which are electrical, tend to be precipitated by triggers. And you'll, you'll read and you'll hear or you know people who may have had one of these events during exercise or during, during emotional arousal or during sleep. There are certain things that may trigger uh, these events in different people. Now, we were interested in, in the issue of N3 and sudden death because of the, a set of animal experimental studies that were done in Australia um, in a nutrition center there by Charnot and Lellon. And these studies started in the 80s, went into the 90s, and then continued. And basically what they would do was feed the animals different diets and look at an experimental paradigm for ventricular fibrillation and see whether or not the diet influenced BF in animal models, starting with mice, going to dogs, going to macaques, and so on and so forth. So these studies, if you put them together, suggested that omega-3 fatty acid intake reduced vulnerability to triggers of ventricular fibrillation, such as exercise, pharmacologic stress, and this occurred in the setting of experimentally induced myocardial ischemia. And when I started reading this literature, I said to myself, you know, how does this relate to what we see in humans? And there wasn't any human data. Uh, to, to see whether this animal experimental observation uh, related directly to humans. So we were very fortunate, and we got uh, funding from the NIH um, to look at whether dietary intake of these N3 fatty acids uh, from fish and shellfish, particularly focusing on EPA and DHA, whether that was a so higher intake was associated with a lower risk of sudden cardiac arrest. And what we did was called a population-based case control study. Um, it was done here in Seattle and King County. Uh, we identified 334 cases through the paramedic uh, system, the medic one program, and, uh, middle-aged and older, and um, they were similar age and gender. And we developed something which we called the secret intake scale. Now, um, this was my one opportunity to be famous. And I, I actually uh, chose to let it go. Uh, as you know, my last name is Siskovic. The first three letters are S-I-S. And this is the secret scale. So I could have I could have been known as Walter Willett is of the Willett questionnaire. I could have been known as the SIS. scale. This this scale, which we developed, covered 28 different types of fish and shellfish available in the Pacific Northwest. And so we really did try to do an exhaustive job to, at, at that time. This is the late 1980s, early 1990s. And we were using this scale to estimate omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. And we also, in this study, uh, we were able to look at red cell fatty acid composition of cell erythrocyte membranes, red cell membranes. And we could do this because the paramedics agreed to draw blood from me in the field at the time of cardiac arrest. And we had confidence that the measures we would make uh, in these cases and non-cases controls were comparable because we had data from 18 primates that showed that death itself didn't affect these measures. So one of the reasons we did this was because we wanted to have two measures that were complementary, each of which had limitations, uh, and, uh, but the, the limitations were different. So these are the primary results from this paper that was published uh, 
as Dr. Britt said, in JAMA in 1995. This was basically looking at dietary intake using the no seafood group as a reference group, looking at four pounds of seafood intake. This was the mean intake in terms of grams of entries per month, ranging from one gram to 14 grams. This, this group was taking in about two servings of, uh, three ounce servings of fat and fish a week. And, you, and what's down here is the so-called odds ratio. An odds ratio of one means there's no association. A odds ratio less than one means that those exposed have a lower risk than those not exposed, where the exposure here is the amount of entry in diet relative to the no seafood intake group. And what we showed was that there was a reduction in risk, so that this group here had approximately half of the risk of the no seafood group, half of the risk of sudden cardiac arrest, which, again, in terms of the amount of, of fish intake, the entry content and the outcome was strikingly similar to the Cromwell paper in the New England Journal published a decade before. <coughs> in terms of the cell membrane fatty acids, we also were able to show that higher levels of the cell membrane fatty uh, entry fatty acids in the cell membrane, looking at entries as a proportion of total fatty acids ranging from 3% to 7%, that again, with, with higher levels of these fatty acids, EPA plus DHA in the membrane, you had a lower risk of sudden cardiac arrest. This was based on a smaller N, but it was, um, it was uh, quite striking. And in fact, if we went back to this slide and looked at dietary intake, if we adjusted for the cell membrane level, uh, these estimates here all moved towards the null. They all moved towards not one, which meant that it was very, the, the analysis was consistent with my hypothesis that fish intake influenced fatty acid level, influenced risk of sudden death. And that was, that was quite striking. Now, what you like to see when you're an investigator is somebody replicate your work. Uh, if your work is not durable, it really is not meaningful. We were very fortunate that the, that the group in Harvard, which had looked at these questions, but had looked at them in terms of total coronary heart disease events, not focusing, on the non seafood intake group as a reference group, and, and also um, not focusing on fatty fish or N3s, uh, went back and reanalyzed their data. And this was one of the studies they did. They, they, did, they looked at data from the Physicians Health Study, which was a large study of US male physicians, um, and they had food frequency data on these and follow up for 11 years. And during that time, there were 133 sudden deaths and 737 non fatal myocardial infarctions. And the outcome in this study was both, there was one outcome of sudden cardiac death, there was one outcome of non-fatal myocardial infarction. So here's a sudden death outcome. If you compare people who were seafood eaters to those who were relatively not less than once a month, these groups tend to have a lower risk than those who were non-seafood eaters. And if you looked at the relationship between the same categorization of intake of fish with non-fatal myocardial infarction, this is one. This means that non-fatal myocardial infarction was not related to fish intake in this population, even though sudden cardiac death was. And one of the hypotheses that we had when we looked at the inconsistencies of the data was that by combining endpoints, you may miss an important uh, counterphysiologic association. So then they also went back, they also proceeded uh, to not only look at fish intake, but um, Christine Albert, uh, who did the other work in the physician's health study, decided to look at blood fatty acid composition. She, had, she didn't have plasma phospholipid erythrocytes, she just had total blood fatty acids, and she looked at it, in this case, in 94 cases and 184 controls from the same study that I just showed you. And look at what she found. This is her data, percent of fatty acids in whole blood and risk risk of sudden cardiac death. It's strikingly similar to what we reported from our case control study. This is a prospective study. The blood was collected at one point in time. People were followed forward. She then she identified all the sudden deaths, a sample of the non-cases, and this is what she found. Remarkably similar. So then we asked the question, um, you know, does modest intake uh, a fish its relationship with uh, mortality from coronary disease or ischemic heart disease, is it specific for dark meat fish 
that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. And we looked at this in a, another large cohort study called the Cardiovascular Health Study, which is coordinated here at the University of Washington. It's been going on since 1988, and uh, initially enrolled almost 6,000 adults over the age of 65, average age of 72 at entry. And this analysis was done after 9.3 uh, years of follow-up and used frequency questionnaire data, and it focused on arrhythmic data. And interestingly, when we looked at tuna or other uh, 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 basically baked or broiled fish, uh, we found this relationship. Again, you see that if you consume uh, this type of fish uh, on a, uh, a modest amount of it on a regular basis, your risk was about half uh, of having an arrhythmic death, which is similar to what we call sudden cardiac death, uh, compared to, to people who consume uh, these types of fish, uh, much less commonly. However, if you looked at fried fish, <laughs> you actually got the opposite point. And that is, this is one, no association. An odds ratio of a relative risk higher than one means that the risk is increased if you're exposed to, in this case, fried fish. So if you were exposed to fried fish, it was not associated with anything on the left of one, a lower risk. If anything, there was a question of whether it was associated with a higher risk. Now, I haven't talked at all about confounding, which basically is, you know, there are other factors that are accounting for these associations. I should have said that in all of these studies, these are all observational studies, none of them are clinical trials, all of these studies try to measure as many potential confounders as possible, try to control for them, and show that these associations that I'm showing you, uh, for simplicity's sake, were not accounted for by differences in age, gender, race, physical activity, education, other dietary factors, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, drugs that they're on or not on, et cetera, et cetera. So to the best of our ability, given the observational nature of the studies, we try to exclude other explanations from other factors. That having said that, people who eat fried fish are definitely different from the people who eat the baked and boiled fish in this study. Those who eat fried fish tended to be of lower education, have, have lifestyles that were less healthy, and have diets that were, were different. So, it, it, for example, they might take in um, half a serving less of red meat a week, or they might eat uh, uh, one serving less of fruits and vegetables a week, and, and so on and so forth. So they did differ. It's just that those differences didn't appear to account for the observations that were made. Now, this is actually a slide to represent a paper that's going to be coming out in early April in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, that, that uh, the first author is Gary Mosaferia. And again, it's, a, it's an analysis from the cardiovascular health study. In, in this, in this uh, report, we're looking at 16 years of follow-up, starting at an average age of 74. So you're starting with folks at average age of 74, you're following for 16 years. In this case, we're not looking at diet. We're looking at plasma phospholipid fatty acids, EPA and DHA. And in this case, we also looked at DPA, which is more metabolically determined than determined by fish and data. And in this, this report, the focus is on mortality. Total mortality, coronary heart, cardiovascular and coronary heart disease mortality, and mortality from arrhythmic death or sudden cardiac death. Um, suffice it to say that this study provides additional evidence to support our earlier observations. There is about a 20% lower risk of total mortality if you compare the upper quintile of EPA and DHA to the lower, lowest quintile of EPA and DHA. That 20% reduction in total mortality is accounted for by a 30% reduction in cardiovascular mortality and that's accounted for by a 50% lower risk of sudden cardiac death. So just as the other studies have pointed in this direction, um, this, is pointing, uh, this study is pointing in the direction as well, and it shows that, that the association in this study of coronary heart disease mortality plus non-fatal events is due to the reduction in coronary heart disease mortality. One of the things I did want to show you from this study was this slide. Because from our original work, we had the hypothesis that some was better than none, and it wasn't clear that more was better than less. And, and we also had the thought that maybe the relationship between dietary intake of EPA and DHA, the association with fatty acids in cell membranes was not uh, a plasma phospholipid 
was not um, uh, basically uh, there, that there was a threshold and not a, a strict dose response relationship. And this figure that's going to be in this paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine is very consistent with the idea that modest intake of fatty fish and modest intake of EPA plus EHA basically loads your membranes. And you know, more doesn't do much compared to, to, to less, if you get less is there. Interestingly, the, the highest quintile had, had uh, an average EPA DHA that was around here, and the lowest was around here. And the difference between this and this ended up being like one serving of oil with baked fish. In it. So it's, it's, uh, <coughs> there's some internal consistency. Of course, it could all be wrong, but uh, it does appear to be consistent. Um, in terms of limitations, there are major limitations in terms of dietary assessment. There are limitations in terms of assessment of fatty acids, although we measure fatty acids with pretty good precision. And for EPA and DHA, um, we basically, as my mother would have said, we are what you eat. So while metabolism impacts EPA and DHA just as it impacts all the other fatty acids, um, if you take in more EPA and DHA, at least within that range that I just showed you, you have higher levels. And you are what you eat. Um, in terms of bias, I'm really referring here to the impact of other factors. Uh, other than dietary intake of, of, of fish or DHA. And we try to deal with bias as best as we can, but there's always the question of, well, you didn't measure this or you didn't measure it well, and it could still bias the results. Um, when you have associations that are very strong, and certainly a 50% a lower risk, and I use the word lower rather than risk reduction because risk reduction is what you evaluate the clinical trial, we're just observing a 50% lower risk in this population, when you have an effect that large, it's not highly likely that confounding accounts for it, but it certainly isn't something you can say uh, you can rule out. In terms of generalizability, when I gave a, a talk on this topic at Harvard to their nutrition seminar, and Walter Willett was in the group, and Christine Albert and others, I told them that many people worry that studies of physicians and nurses and health professionals are not generalizable to the rest of the population when I was coming there to tell them that our work in Seattle, that they had basically reproduced our findings in those populations, which I think sort of suggests that their populations are generalizable to uh, a community-based study or population-based study, such as the one we did in Seattle. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that there is also it was a consistency of findings of these observational epidemiologic studies with evidence from voltage clamping, from studies of isolated cardiomyocytes, from animal experimental work, from other observational studies, and from a clinical trial called GC Prevenzioni, which was a low-dose supplement trial in post-MI men in Italy, conducted in the 1990s, where they, where they gave a men 850 milligrams of confined EPA plus DHA. In that trial, they also gave the men vitamin E in a factorial design. They thought the vitamin E was going to be active. They thought the omega-3 was placebo. It didn't work out that way. What they observed was a, approximately a 20% reduction in total mortality due to a 50% reduction in sudden cardiac death, and they couldn't believe it. Um, so uh, that, was, that was the data through, let's say, 2002, 2005. And that sort of led to a mechanism that we thought of that antirhythmic uh, properties of the fatty acids might explain the lower risk of sudden death in the setting of coronary disease. And, and you know, so we had, you know, we thought we had a pretty good story. And that, that, that story led us to write about something which we, uh, uh, amongst ourselves, thought of as diet hard in new era, where you had this syllogism that intake of fatty fish altered the N3 CUFA uh, content of tissue, such as cardiac. <coughs> Uh, myocyte membranes that uh, changes or differences in those cardiac myocyte membranes alter cardiac ion channel function. That ion channel function influences ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death, whether it's a sodium channel, calcium channel, calcium channel. And that, that less ventricular fibrillation and sudden cardiac death accounts for 
a reduction in coronary heart disease mortality. Now, that's, that was the story, you know, I would say through the um, early part of the last decade. More recently, there have been a series of clinical trials that have been reported, most of which are secondary to prevention. They either focus on individuals who've had a myocardial infarction, uh, most of them focus on supplements, and uh, these trials have, have tended to be negative. That is, they do not see benefit from omega-3 fatty acids. And as a result, there's considerable controversy that N3 fatty acids um, have a, a potential uh, a beneficial effect on the heart. Um, these studies look at N3 supplements in individuals who've had uh, life-threatening arrhythmia for the most part and had an implantable cardioverter defibrillator placed, an ICD. And those people were then randomized to the supplement or not. They're also obviously on maximal medical therapy. Um, they're not necessarily the same people who you study in these cohort studies who basically initially tend to be healthy or at least a lot healthier than somebody who has had a life threatening arrhythmia. Um, other studies, such as these studies here, there were two uh, recent studies, one an N3 supplement study in Germany, and one the Alpha Omega trial done by Don Kromholt in Holland, um, looked at either N3 supplements or dietary enrichment with N3 fatty acids and margarine. And uh, Don's, both of these papers were published in the New Journal. Uh, Don and his colleagues basically supplemented margarine with either EPA and DHA or ALA, the plant-based N3, and um, they were not able to show evidence in the overall study that dietary enrichment with N3s in post-MI patients reduced the risk of sudden cardiac death. Now, in, in these studies, it turns out that in the 2000s, when these studies were started, medical therapy had, had uh, and the, the, basically the treatment of uh, coronary heart disease had changed. So almost 90 or more percent of the individuals in each of these trials had coronary artery revascularization procedures, either bypass surgery or percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, sometimes with stem placement. Um, in addition, the therapies used uh, in patients who've had MI include statins, uh, angiotensin um, uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, aspirin, and beta blockers. And because these, these patients in these two studies, the one in Holland and the one in Germany, were really treated very well in terms of adherence to current guidelines for treatment of post-MI patients, in each of these studies, the rates of sudden death were significantly lower than what was predicted at the beginning of the study. So in, instead of having 5 or 6% of their uh, patient population experiencing that, they had something between 1.5 and 2%. And so it looked like the maximal medical management, even in the placebo group, was lowering the risk of sudden cardiac death, making it more difficult to show benefit, but also possibly meaning that because of secular changes in treatment, you know, the findings of GC Prevenzioni from the 90s aren't the findings, you know, in the latter part of, uh, you know, from 2005 on. So what's the message? Um, is it a care picture? Should we eat fish? And I, I'm not sure that that's the right question because I don't, as, as you can see, I think the difference is in, in fish. And I, you know, I, I sort of, I, I'm an, I, 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 I think of people as doing, there are people who do analysis, there are people who do advocacy, and the people who do activism. And I do analysis, and I try to provide information for people who want to do advocacy and activism. I actually do a little bit of advocacy because I'm a volunteer for the American Heart Association. But, but I think that, that one of the things we should do is remember the lessons we learned in the past. You know, and I think those lessons include what's the question, what's the approach, what do they find, what does it mean? Are, what outcome are they studying? If they're studying, uh, for example, here, they're looking at N3 supplements and atrial fibrillation after coronary surgery. It's a very different outcome than, than looking at sudden death in a population of people who are recruited from the community using Medicare eligibility 
So we want to we want to uh, uh, remember the lessons learned from the past. We, pro we probably should be. Oops. I'm sorry. We probably should be considering secular trends, both in health and healthcare, and in diet, because I'm a believer that the background diet makes a difference. And and so we need to we need to take those things into account. If if in fact as a result of all this research, there are even fewer people not eating fish, or they're eating it differently um, in some way, then that could certainly change uh, the associations that we observe within a population. And then finally, I'd say let's focus on the basics. Everybody should focus on the four questions. Whether you're a lay person reading a newspaper or looking you know, on a website or listening to, to cable TV news, you really need to sort of recognize that if you ask a different question, you may get a different answer, and it doesn't mean that the answer you got before was wrong. Um, we should think about differences in outcomes in terms of acute coronary events that tend to be due primarily to what's happening in the coronary arteries. Do they have atherosclerosis? Do they have thrombosis? Do they have atherosclerotic disease? Heart failure, which is an increasingly important outcome as our population ages and people survive coronary events and hypertension and diabetes and other risk factors uh, impact the myocardium, the heart muscle to lead to fibrosis, which leads to stiffness of the ventricle, which leads to heart failure. We call it heart failure now, heart failure with and without preserved systolic function. So you get a heart that doesn't look big and baggy, but it is not normal because it doesn't relax because it has this myocardial fibrosis. And, and then you have sudden death which involves ion channels, but it also involves myocardial fibrosis, it also involves coronary disease, but it's, it's, it, it's a condition that we should be looking at in and of itself. It's important in and of itself. So should we eat fish? Well, these are the sort of take home messages um, that I'd like to share with you today. One is, uh, think about fatty fish is not necessarily the same as eating fried fish. And you know, when uh, policy, makers uh, say to the public, uh, eat one to two fish meals a week. Be careful, because they may go to McDonald's and have a fried fish sandwich, or the new you know, fish tidbits or whatever they're selling is pollock, and it, it may not be doing them any good. It may actually do harm. So I think we do need to be specific in terms of what we recommend. The idea that some is better than none, I think is really important because um, there are pockets in the population where eating fish is really uncommon. I do work in the strong heart study with one of my mentors who's a postdoc, and she uh, learned that 4% of the American Indians in the Plains and Little Reservations in North Dakota, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and Arizona eat fish. 4%. 4%. They eat a lot of spam. It's a commodity. So they eat a lot of canned meat. I'm including canned fish. Um, a single serving, three ounces of fatty fish a week may actually make a difference. The American Heart recommends two or more servings a week. I think that's maybe excessive because a lot of people don't eat any. Um, the benefits clearly outweigh the risks as it relates to total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, sudden death. And we had you know, a paper where my colleague Guy Rosaparian looked at mercury and toenails in the harbor, two of the Harvard cohorts, and was not able to show that there was an association between mercury and toenails and cardiovascular disease. What he did show was, as you'd expect, the mercury levels were somewhat higher in people who ate more fish. Just that the, the, what we're looking at is the balance of risks and benefits and clearly, whatever benefits there are, if there are risks, they're being outweighed by benefits. Um, this issue of not high dose entry supplements relates to the dose response curve that I showed you and the fact that I don't think there's any evidence that more is better than less. So, folks who recommend three, four, five grams of entry supplements a day, I don't really know what the evidence base is for that. And 
I don't feel that you, supplement use is the same as dietary intake. Uh, there are obviously other components of fish as a mixture that, that may be important, um, whether it's a vitamin D or whatever, but, but I, I think we can't equate the two. Even though I told you, I think that a lot of this impact is due to the fatty acids as reflected by the research we and others. So finally, I'm saying that more is not better than less is I don't think we, we need to beat our patients or beat the population to say you have to you know, have fish five days a week, three days a week, or whatever. I think, I think we can, that modest intake, as Don Cromwell demonstrated in 1985, may have a, a profound effect that would uh, justify um, answering the question, should we eat fish by saying, yeah, we should have some fish. Fatty fish it shouldn't be fried. Let's uh, let's uh, see if it helps us. So I think that's let's see if that's. Uh, just wanted to point out my funding for our funding. This is all collaborative. It came from the Clinical Nutrition Research Unit here at the University of Washington. It was just starting in 1988 when I came back here, and I was one of the first people to get a pilot feasibility grant from it. Um, over the years, I've participated in renewals of their NIH um, I would say four or five times. Because without their support, we wouldn't have done any of this work I would have been to talk about it. Um, Their work led to the equivalent of 10 NIH R01 grants. Uh, not all of those grants were done <coughs> for fatty acids, but none of them would, be, would have been done if we didn't do the work in fatty acids, because when we threw the blood, separated the white cells, so we had DNA, as well as red cell membranes, as well as plasma. So we have very unique resources as a result of the funding and collaboration of the clinical nutrition research institute. We also have funding from the Medic One Foundation, and most of our funding has come from the National Heart Institute. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you very much, and I uh, hope that we're able to get something out of this company. Heart failure, 
is a, ma is a major uh, contributor to uh, ventricular fibrillation, heart failure rates. Um, whether it's due to the myocardial fibrosis, whether it's due to hypertension and its treatment, or to diabetes, which contribute to myocardial fibrosis, um, isn't known. But you know what? I think one of the things that Darry has done, which is great, is that he, he, he not only looked at the exposures and the outcomes, but he looked at what we call intermediate outcomes or surrogates. For example, in the cardiovascular health study, we had echocardiography. So we can look at hemodynamic measures to see which hemodynamic measures are impacted by fission. Turns out one of the hemodynamic measures that's impacted is a measure of ventricular relaxation. So if you take in this fish, you have better ventricular relaxation, which I said is related to heart failure. It's also related to sudden death. So there, you know, what the exact mechanism is, I'm not 100 percent sure, but there are a number of plausible mechanisms. Darius looked at the impact of things like heart rate. Heart rate is, is slower in people who take in uh, fish, fat fish. And lower heart rate is associated with lower risk of some death. So there are a number of different potential effects. Um, I mentioned earlier to um, one of the faculty members that, that we should do sort of uh, uh, nutraceuticals or diet uh, as we do drugs in the sense that they have multiple effects. And, and you know, uh, so in some ways, the, I, I really like the total mortality story of people who are age 74 because it integrates it. The other thing I didn't mention, I should have about that paper, is that the paper's going to report that among individuals who live to age 65, that if they ate royal debate fish or tuna, that they added 2.2 years to their life, which is really quite astounding. Um, as you know, life expectancy has increased in men and women in the United States. One of the drivers of that is a lower risk of ventricular fibrillation in some way. Still occurs, still accounts for about 12% of all deaths, and about 50% of the deaths from chronic heart disease, which remains the number one killer, but it occurs later. So that's really quite amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, great talk, and it made me think about a whole bunch of different things. Um, and, and one of them was uh, when you uh, made mention of uh, tribal fish intake. And that started me thinking about um, how uh, the results, all of the results that you spoke about, might be translated into uh, messages out to communities how we get people to actually change behaviors. And you might comment on that, but the question I actually want to ask you is a quirky way of asking that larger community question. Has anybody looked at the um, religious influence on um, heart disease? And here I'm thinking about the obvious be a Catholic and fish on Friday. Um, because, because, that's a, because that's a general rule that pervades a very large global population. So is there any? Yeah, so let me, let me sort of respond by saying that the social context is yeah. very important in influencing behaviors and influencing risk factors, some clinical disease, clinical disease, and outcomes. Mm -hmm. And as part of that social context, religious affiliation, observance, acculturation, whatever. There are many, many different factors. Um, how, how much stress, how to deal with stress, whether you have support, if you don't have support, uh, what kind of support, and so on and so forth. So the whole issue of what are the determinants of health behaviors, how can we, how can we uh, modify uh, behavior is, is incredibly important. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm very involved in American Heart, mm -hmm. and the American Heart has uh, a set of 2020 uh, goals which uh, basically boiled down to reducing uh, cardiovascular mortality by 20% by the year 2020. Uh, that's relative to 2006. And improving cardiovascular health by 20%. And cardiovascular health included seven factors, one of which was diet. Among the dietary factors was fish and fish. So there's attention to this. Uh, an organization like AHA has people who do community interventions. They, they look at life cycle. They look at advocacy, they try to work with industry, um, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think your point about interventions, evaluating 
what factors might influence the success of interventions. It's critical, particularly at this point in time. A lot, in a lot of instances, like blood pressure, smoking, obesity, we don't need more, you know, the, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of evidence to provide a rationale for you know, trying to improve health as it relates to those characteristics. The real challenge is you know, figuring out what works and what doesn't work in terms of interventions and sort of what costs. Do we interview individuals? Do we interview families? Do we interview with church groups, with schools, on work sites? Do we interview with communities? Do we interview with the whole population? Do we pick out subsets of the population that are particularly high risk because they have health disparities? I mean, there's a whole series of seminars going on in the nutritional sciences group in the School of Public Health. It has to do with access to health treatments. Mm -hmm. And if you live in a reservation, from what I learned from my, my trainee who's an American Indian, is that access to food is a real issue. Most of the food is bought at, at convenience stores. There are issues with getting fresh food. There are issues with and other issues. There are issues with commodities that are provided by the U.S. government to treat. So there are, there are many complexities here. I think that we, you know, I don't want people to take, take home the message that, that we can't do anything. The challenge is to find out you know, what we should be doing now, what do we need to learn so we can do better later, you know, in the future, and so on and so forth. And, uh, yeah, I have to one of, the, one of the messages in the 2020 goals is, is the importance of primordial prevention. That is preventing hypertension, preventing diabetes, preventing obesity. In order to do that, you have to intervene very early in life. From one of the speakers earlier in the series, you probably have to intervene on the first before uh, they conceive uh, um, and before they have pregnancies. So in some, some ways, I, I tell people, yeah, we can talk about 2020 goals, but I think if we're really interested in primordial prevention, we have to think about birth cohorts, or cohorts of pregnant women, or women at risk for being pregnant, and their, and their uh, significant other spouse, and, and basically think about where do we want to be in 2060, 2080, 3000. It's not too early. Can you comment on um, the role of conflicting health messages? Eat fish, it's good for your heart. Don't eat fish, you're going to get too much mercury, and how that plays kind of into this. So why don't you tell me what you think yeah. the role of conflicting <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I actually like your summary of one fish a week which showed benefit, because so, then it doesn't so, conflict with the mercury of, you know, So when I, when I did, yeah, when, when our group published the JAMA paper in 1995, I got calls from Wall Street Journal said, well, Dr. Siskovic, the Harvard group, published a paper six months ago that showed that more wasn't better than less when it came to fish and heart disease. So I told them exactly what I told you this lecture. Okay? They then got it right, they reported it. It turned out the Harvard group then went back and reanalyzed their data. And then they got it right. So, okay? how so what the thing is that the public is confused because yeah. they hear more isn't better than less, so they think I don't need to eat fish. Or they, or they think that Fish, you know, N3 fatty acids doesn't reduce the risk of post-op atrial fibrillation, so I don't need to eat fish, fatty fish. You're, you know, I think you're right on. And prob one of the problems is to eat this into sound bites. I mean, I had a lot of experience at an early age. You know, I was like 30 years old, and I had a paper that they got a lot of attention, and and, and so on and so forth. So I had a lot of experience with media even before this. But this is really important to get messages out. But then what happens is the whole point here of this talk is that we forget about the lessons we learned. And things do change, and maybe things aren't the same now as they were when we started our study in 1988, 1990. You know? um, but we really have to be careful what we communicate to the public. I got very upset when the AHA said you have to have two or more fatty fish meals a week. I think that's unreasonable. I mean, it could be that they're right, that two is optimal. But I think one is better than none. So get people, you know, the, the people who, are, who, who aren't eating one, get them to eat one. Don't make the bar so high. So I agree with you fully that messages and the way the messages are conveyed, and you know, the, 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 I mean, a lot of times 
you have people reporting on science who know nothing about science. Um, maybe it'll change now with the internet, and with blogs, and with, and with, with text messaging, and so on and so forth, where we can do a better job of communicating you know, risk and benefit and, and encouraging the population to do, do uh, things that we think will you know, prevent disease, promote health. Yeah, I'm very passionate about that. Yeah. Other, other <laughs> questions? Yeah. So, so, what is missing from the sublime? What are the sublimes not capturing? I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know if there's something. If your question is a good question because I said I think that EPA and DHA are, the, are important, okay, in the membrane. And you can certainly increase the membrane level by, by taking the supplements. If you're already eating a fatty fish meal a week and you take a supplement, Put you, you know, on the flat part of the curve, where, you know, you're you're not doing much. Uh, if, you know, if, if if more isn't better than less in terms of risk reduction, just increasing your fatty acids from five percent of total to six percent of total to seven percent of total may not do much. So part of it is what's the, what are you comparing? You know, what's the reference group? Is it not is it very low levels of fatty acids? And then the other. The other issue is the relationship may not be linear. It may actually be J-shaped. So it's possible that when you really get out there, you're not only not doing benefit, you may be doing harm. So I don't, I don't, uh, and then the, the, the other explanation is we don't know whether it's the DHA, the EPA, you know, uh, the relative amount of the two, and how that relates to what's in the N3 capsule. Okay? We, in this paper, we look separately, that is, the paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine in early April looked separately at fatty acids. We measured fatty acids in approximately 2,500 people. And we looked separately at DHA, at DPA, and EPA. And there's still some question as whether those are equivalent in terms of their impact on outcome. Okay? So if, if your N3 capsules are mostly EPA, and what's most effective is DHA, then that could be one possibility. Although I also mentioned that the the um, GC Prevenzione used, used supplements. But that, that data, again, was from a different era where intake may be much lower. Intake of fish may be much lower. Now, I, I, I mentioned to somebody, I've been in the General Nutrition Center once, and one of my sons dragged me in there because he wanted something to help him bulk up. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it wasn't a steroid. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was something protein. But I walked, I walked in there, I walked in there, and I see omega-3, like, incredible. What did we do? What did we do to the country and the economy, you know, by publishing research that suggested that omega-3 fatty acids might reduce your risk of sudden death? It's not what we intended. I mean, we, do, we definitely always say we look at the diet and not look at the supplements. That's not to say supplements might, might not be a benefit to some populations. We need to evaluate. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> well, please come join us for a live reception outside.